Good morning, everyone. It's nice to see you all here uh, on what, at least in the Twin Cities, is a snowy morning. Looks like we finally got some snow to cover that ice that we have out there, so that will make things nice and treacherous. <laughs> so take it easy if you're going out. My talk this morning is titled, So Far, So Good. And I got the title from a story that Charlotte Joko Beck tells in one of the pieces in her book, Nothing Special. And I'm going to tell you the story. It's very brief. So hang on. It's very brief. There, once, uh, there was once a man who climbed to the top of a 10-story building and jumped off. As he passed the fifth floor on his way down, he was heard to say, so far, so good. <laughs> I love that story. I love that so far, so good. You know, it's just, uh, it's so, uh, it's, it's, uh, well, we, I think we all get it, right? So far, so good. It's kind of a silly statement to make. What does it mean? I mean, you know, when, when I thought about starting out my talk with that story, and then I was going to start talking about it, I went, yeah, what is it? What exactly is so far so good? It's a good question. It's a really good question. So I'm going to now kill that joke because I'm going to do what you should never do with a joke. I'm going to explain it, <laughs> but I'm actually not going to explain it too much. I'm just going to talk a little bit about what So Far So Good seems to be saying when that guy's passing the fifth floor. So he knows he's got 10 floors. Hey, so far, I haven't gotten to the end yet. You know, so far, so good. He hasn't hit anything. He hasn't reached the bottom. Because as we know, I think the fall itself isn't the problem. There's that old saying, it's not the fall that kills you, but the sudden stop at the end. <laughs> so he's saying, so far, so good. I haven't reached that sudden stop at the end. As if reaching the bottom, as if reaching that sudden stop is somehow bad. And I think perhaps we recognize that sentiment. I watch enough movies to know that in American cinema, beating death is winning and dying is losing, right? So we can see that reaching the bottom then is bad. So when he's at the fifth floor, still falling, so far so good. And if you don't see dying or getting sick, for example, as bad, you might see at least this capitulation. Either way you look at it, it is odd because the end is inevitable after all. Just not now, as the guy's passing the fifth floor, perhaps, you know, but it is inevitable. And so that little story that I like, that little joke I get, it's sort of a metaphor for the usual way we, we live our life. And we know ultimately what's coming. We know that. We at least know it intellectually. And we might dread it. But if it hasn't come yet, you know, and my guess is if you're saying it hasn't come yet, it hasn't come yet, you know, then we consider ourselves to be doing pretty good. And you can think of that story of the guy jumping off the 10 story building as each story is roughly being a decade, because it also kind of gets you to see how we usually move through our life. Now I know 10 stories means 100 years. And I think most of us would say that that probably would be the decade in which we would probably pass away as we reach 100. I don't know how many of us are anticipating living to 110, but you know, so you, you know by then for sure, you're probably gonna be reaching that end. So well, the first few floors we're going, oh, probably even think about anything at all. It's when he gets to the fifth floor. It's when we, when we think we're about halfway down that we start seriously thinking about where it is we're headed. <laughs> where is this thing going? But how do we know where that halfway point is? Because it does seem to be where people think the halfway point is, is where they start to ruminate on mortality, ruminate on that end. But we don't know where that point is going to be. It could happen tomorrow. We could be teenagers. We could be in our 20s. And what is that end we're talking about? Well, of course, we know what that is, that end. I mean, we know death. We know death is the end we probably realized we were living under a death sentence when we were children. 
I, I can't tell you how old I was. I know I've talked about this in talks before, but it was just such, you know, um, it was such a, an experience. I still remember my mom telling me that I was going to die and that people I knew who I loved were going to die. And it really, I just remember being really surprised. The whole thing sounded wrong. <laughs> it didn't sound like that's the way things are supposed to be. It sure didn't sound fair. And, you know, just, so I remember that. And I remember the impact that that had on me. It really was, it was a surprise. It, it hurt. It stung. And so at that point, I think I really tasted, I really felt what that meant, at least according to you know, how I was starting to understand the world, who I was. But there's something else that goes along with, with death. You know? So as I got older, then you just, you, you intellectualize it. You, you understand, okay, death is a part of being alive. And, and that's, we just sort of compartmentalize it. We put it, it's, it's the end. It's the thing that happens when we're 80 or 100, right? We give it that kind of, we kind of anticipate we're gonna have so much time on this planet that loved ones are gonna have so much time on this planet. But we don't really think too much about what it is that this is the end of. What is this the end of? What is this death? And of course, again, you know, I've been talking about this, it's the end of those we love, those we don't love. It's the end of me. I think that me is the one that really is the rub. It's painful to be with loved ones who are dying. And yet it's not. I mean, I make that sound like that's the only experience. Now, I was with my mom. She had breast cancer and died of that. And I was fortunate to be able to help take care of her. Right. So I know that the experience was much fuller and much richer than sorrow or angst. There was just more to it than that. But when we're thinking of that end, there's that me that is there that is gonna end. You know, that is the thing that when I was a kid didn't make any sense, <laughs> you know, cause I was just like going, but I've always been here. You know, I mean, it really was weird to try to imagine what being born, like where, where was I before I was born? I've always been here. So where do I go when I die? That me is gonna end. That was the thing I think that seemed startling and did not seem to make any sense. What is that me? We talk about this a lot, you know, in Buddhist teachings. And that me is that thing that we take for granted, that thing that we assume. It seems to us how our experience is showing up. That is, it seems that I, me, am experiencing this world, that I am having this particular experience right now of talking at a computer and looking at the little animated tiles of you, that I'm having that experience. And that's the end, you know, that's the abrupt end. That's what's gonna be extinguished at that abrupt end, is that me. But our practice, Buddhist practice, interrogates that assumption, that assumption of me. We all know this famous phrase from the Genjo Koan, and you're gonna, oh, here it comes again. But it's one of those teachings that I think we come back to because it's, it, I think it's helpful. And I'm gonna read, well, let me just read, you, you, you'll recognize it. To study the Buddha way is to study the self. To study the self is to forget the self. And you, you can just, Stop right there, right? So Buddhist practice interrogates the assumption of me, of I, of this self that we walk through the world just assuming what that self is. So to study the Buddha way is to study the self. But then Dogen does that surprising thing. He says to study the self is to forget the self. So to study self, to really 
see what self is, is to forget that little self. But this passage goes on. I'm going to read to you the rest of it because I really like the whole passage. To forget the self is to be verified by all things. To be verified by all things is to let one's body and mind and the body and minds of others drop off. All traces of enlightenment come to rest and this rest carries on without end. So Buddhist practice again, to interrogate that assumption of self, the, to study the Buddha ways, to study the self, to study the self is to forget the self and to forget the self is to be verified by all things. And forget the self is an unusual phrase. I think it's uh, when he gets to talking about letting one's body and mind drop off and the bodies of minds of others to let them drop off. That's forgetting that little self. You don't really forget it. It just drops off. It doesn't get in the way. It doesn't become the be all and the end all, right? So it doesn't, it's not the point <clears throat> from which we understand experience when we really take up this, uh, this study. And so once we do that, then the self shines through. Then we see what it is we're studying, that self, not the little self, but the self that shines through when little self drops away, when we let go of body and mind. All traces of enlightenment come to rest. So when we no longer strive for that enlightenment, when the self shines through, is to be aware, that is to live out of awareness, to realize the totality you are. That is interrogating that assumption of that little self. So we sit meditation, that's our practice. We sit meditation and settle into experience. And when we do that, when we settle into just this as it is, and when you sit the formal posture, you know, we could take up this meditation practice and anything we do at any moment of the day, any activity is an opportunity to meditate. But when we're sitting in a meditation hall in particular, it is so stripped down. You know, yesterday, a friend of mine posted a picture of a winter landscape. And it was just, just snowy fields with some trees kind of dotting the, the field off to the horizon. And the sky was almost the same color as the snow. And then you could start looking at the snow and you could see there was like ice on some of the snow. And it created an image that it looked like the snow and the sky looked the same. And I think that something like that is only noticeable in that starkness. The starkness of that landscape brought out the bountifulness of that landscape. And that's our sitting practice, right? When we sit in meditation, we don't have distractions that can easily pull us away, but we just have this, the starkness of this, the bountifulness of this. So then we can really settle into what this is, settle into experience. And we can, when we do that, we can see that that thing that we take for granted, that thing that we assume, that me, that it isn't necessary. This experience actually shows up and it doesn't need that me experiencing it, which we think it does. We, we, again, our, our usual way of seeing this is that I'm experiencing a world that's out there, but when we re re really just settle into experience, we'll see it's just experience. And that that me isn't exactly there or here to be more accurate. It's not that it's not there, but it's not what we take it to be. It's not that thing that we take it to be. We see, we begin to understand, I use that word see, but you can see it as, as knowing. We, we start to know, not in an intellectual sense, but we really start to know that that self is really an explanation. It's just a way of helping us to make sense of what experience is. It's, it's sort of a way of, I mean, it doesn't make sense because we're, we're actually not walking around 
thinking in those terms, like, oh, I have a self now, and now this is explaining, now I get it all. <laughs> you know, that's not the way we think of it. But it actually is consciousness really trying to make sense of this. And we can see that when we settle into the experience and see that that self isn't necessary and that that self isn't really the thing that we take it to be, that we assume that it is. So when, then there, sitting in meditation and awareness, we see self, ours and others, as it is. And we can start to see self, especially that self, the self, you know, that self that we take for granted, that I, in sitting and really paying attention to our experience, we start to see that I as not being a stable, unified thing. Because when we really start to pay attention, we see that our, our experience is never the same from moment to moment. It's continually changing. It's so rich and bountiful, like I was talking about in that picture. It's just continually unfolding, continually thus, never the same from moment to moment. And so you can see then that experiences like that, that I, what we call I, is continually changing as well. You can see that, you can feel that, you can know that. And yet I would guess that our conception of I, the one that we're carrying around with us as we move through the day, the one that we don't interrogate, the one that we don't think about too often, my guess is that that conception of I, in the back of our minds, where we store the I, I'm pointing out my head, I don't know what we do with this, but however we're carrying it around, that our assumption is that it is stable and it is unified. Even if we couldn't tell you exactly what it is, if somebody were to push us on it, to ask us, what are you referring to when you refer to I? Of course, we, the first thing we do, ta-da, you know, here I am. <laughs> but if we really start to interrogate that self, of course, it's hard for us to say what it is exactly we're talking about. But I'm guessing that until that we get to that point where somebody might start interrogating us or we interrogate it ourselves, we think of that self as being stable, being unified, being easily identifiable. And yet, there it is, continually changing. <laughs> and I'm guessing that would surprise us to think of that. You know, Steve Hagen has pointed out in a number of talks that if the self was this stable, unchanging thing, that again, we, we kind of assume that it is. We might argue, ah, oh, it's not the way I think of myself, but it's how we move through our lives as if we are this. You know, I think about George Costanza and Seinfeld. He referred to himself in the third person. <laughs> George isn't going to like this, you know. We have this idea about what we like and what we don't like and things that we do well and things we don't do well and things that are in our character and things that are out of our character. So we do assume that that is some kind of stable thing. But again, if we pay attention to our experience, we start to see experience is always changing and we notice that we're always changing. Oh. As I said, Steve points out, if the this, if this self was actually this stable, unchanging thing, experience would be impossible. It would be impossible. And we can just think of that in terms of the limited way of thinking of the self that we, we have, this I right here. All that means is that if this I, this me that we normally just take for granted didn't change, well, then, uh, you know, if you were cold, you wouldn't be able to warm up. <laughs> you probably wouldn't have gotten cold in the first place. You wouldn't perhaps get some wisdom out of a painful experience. You wouldn't be full. You know, you wouldn't be able to eat a meal till you were full. You wouldn't be able to learn things. You wouldn't be able to, you know, you can just start to see that if the self didn't change in some way and that every experience changes that self, and you know, the quotation mark self, that it has to be that way, that the self has to change with 
conditions as they're changing. It just has to be the case. And again, once you notice that, so if you're still even hanging on to that small self and you start to see that, you can start to see that that's true. I'm guessing that that notion of I, that solid, stable, unified I that we take for granted, maybe that starts to soften. We can understand that. Of course, we can do this intellectually, but maybe we haven't even stepped there yet. But we want to take this past that and really know this, really understand this right now, you know, without having to layer it with that intellectual understanding to really see, you know, that that I is the way we normally understand it is not tangible. It does not make any sense. So then that brings us back to that guy falling down the 10 stories, coming to the abrupt and coming back to death. If this is true, then who dies? You know, you think about that little boy that I was thinking about dying and I'm gonna die and how does this work? But if that eye is changing in every moment, and who dies? What's going on in each moment? There is death in every moment. Right? What had been there goes away. There's life, there's birth in every moment. Something new arises. This shows up, that goes away. That shows up, this goes away instantaneously. You can't well, sometimes you can see things coming and going. You know, this morning when I was sitting meditation, I happened to look out my window and I have a, I don't know, I think it was a shrub at some point, but it's become a tree. <laughs> and, uh, and I looked out my window and I saw a squirrel perched on a branch looking right in my window. <laughs> and I don't think he saw me at first. And then I moved and then he looked and he was, you know, kind of sitting like this and he looked right at me. And um, then I just adjusted the, the uh, blanket that I have on my legs to warm myself up a little bit. And I turned and he was gone. <laughs> so sometimes things are noticeable, that coming and going. But really the coming and going, the things, the things that are born into this moment, the things that die in this moment, it's instantaneous. And it is the nature of things that they arise and that they, they uh, go away. That is their nature. That is the nature of things that exist in that way that we think of things existing. You know, things that appear, that show up. They show up, they go away. That's impermanence. Right? We've heard that teaching before. It's one of the three marks of existence, impermanence. And we can understand impermanence in the context of death, with capital D, death. Right, so I was talking about death in every moment. Maybe that small d death because it's just going on and we don't really make too big of a deal of it. But that end of the 10 story drop, you know, the thing that's at the end of our life, that's capital D death because that's something we give a lot of thought to and we freak out about. So, but in that context, we can see impermanence in the context of capital D death. Right? We can understand the concept of impermanence. It's easy for us to understand that things come and go. And again, they don't even have to be, it doesn't have to be capital D death. It can just be, you know, uh, I probably used this as an example before, but look what I have. I have an iPod Nano. <laughs> this is something that shouldn't be here anymore. <laughs> it's something that should go, you know. So I hang on to my, my technology until the technology companies say, you can't have that anymore. We're not playing with you if that's the thing you're going to use. I had a rotary phone until the phone company just, first they charged me more for it. And I said, I'm okay with that. <laughs> you know, there's something pleasurable in dialing a phone number. At least I thought there was, especially if it had a couple really long numbers in it, you know. You know, there was something, I just didn't want to give it up. Well, so I guess what I'm saying is we understand impermanence it doesn't even have to be capital D death. We understand it with things as well. We understand that some things are just going to 
either become obsolete or they're going to wear out. But we understand that intellectually. But impermanence is a little more difficult to really know, you know, to really know it more than intellectually. Again, because on one hand, death, our the death of that small self, again, all things that are showing up and that here's this self that's showing up, it's going to come to an end. It's hard for us to imagine. I mean, it's, what's it going to look like? <laughs> Who knows what it's going to look like? And yet we can know impermanence is right now. We can actually taste this right now, that this is the very nature of what we're experiencing. So when I talk about capital D death and the way we get hung up in it, and I, I remember somebody telling me once, I, I had given a talk about impermanence and um, it must be a theme I like to talk about. I, I do think this is an important theme. You know, For Dogen to understand impermanence was to understand this teaching. You know, permanence is very important. And again, we can understand it intellectually, but it's to really know it, right? To really see what's going on. You understand that it's going on, you know, to put it that way, it's going on in every moment. Impermanence is now. That's now. This is, right now is impermanence. So that capital D, death, that we construct is, is just an idea that we put onto the nature of Buddha nature. I mean, it's Buddha nature, right? It's it's this is Buddha nature. Impermanence is Buddha nature, right? It's it's uh, it's going on right now. So when we give it the capital D and we give it some kind of meaning, suddenly we're separating it out from this experience. We're separating it out from, in a way, reality. We're giving it its own reality. Something you know, unusual is going on there. And hey, you know, I get that. I get that, you know, I'm not, not saying I'm at all comfortable when I really get down thinking about not being here any longer, you know, but I can see that it is this, it's, it's this right now, what we're, to be able to hear me talking right now, to have this experience, this is going on, this thing that we're calling death, this impermanence is now. And if we really settle into this, we can see this impermanence is so thoroughgoing that ultimately there's nothing that goes away. Right? So we think of impermanence as this thing, and then this thing becomes obsolete, and then we toss it, or it breaks down, or it vanishes in some way. We can see that impermanence is thoroughgoing. If we can really taste that, you can see that there's actually nothing there, which is not to say, I say there's nothing there. It's not really that there's not. It's not that there's nothing, it's that there's no thing there. There's no thing that's showing up. So that capital D death is just this impermanence. It's just reality working itself out. And again, we give it some special meaning. Now I'm saying this not to deny death. I hope I've been making that clear. And I think of a poem that Norm cited this summer. It was really, I, I think many people remembered this. It was just a devastatingly beautiful poem by the poet Isa. Very short poem. And I found a translation of it online. I don't know that it was quite as elegant as the one that Norm quoted, but it's pretty similar. The world of dew. A world of dew it is indeed. And yet... And yet, the world of dew, you know, this impermanent world we live in, like dew that evaporates in the light of the morning sun. A world of dew it is indeed. That is its nature. This indeed is this world. And yet, and yet, we are still touched we still things go away and we're touched by that death where is thy sting john dunn asked in his famous poem talking about very similar theme but death where is thy sting death has can have a sting to it you know it's it can be painful we don't deny death we don't deny that this body 
is going to die, that I am going to die, whatever that means. This is the thing is we think we know what that means. What's taking place isn't the stories we tell ourselves. And if we give death that capital D importance, you know right there you're adding something to reality. But it is of the nature of this body to die, right? So when we talk about death is right now, is not to deny death. Because if we deny death, we can't be free from it. And that's what my talk is leading to, is we can be free from death. We can't deny it. We can't escape it. But we can be free from it. I'm guessing that guy who jumped off that building, unless he's thinking about things differently than it looks like he is, I'm guessing that, you know, fifth floor so far so good, but what does he do when he's about a foot above the ground? <laughs> I'm guessing that's not so good anymore, right? You know, then things start to go, ah, oh, you know, you imagine the cartoons where they're falling and they start doing this thing in the air where they try to slow themselves down. And in a cartoon, sometimes they actually do that. <laughs> they stop just before they hit. So you can imagine that guy doing that. But why are you doing that? Yeah, because you're not free from death. You know it was coming. So far, so good. <laughs> but you're not free from it. You might think you are because, hey, so far, so good, you know. But there's still that so good part that is kind of getting in the way. <clears throat> so I'm reminded, as I'm telling this, of a story about Shinryu Suzuki. And again, I know it's a story I've shared before, but I, it's a good story. And I, I just happened to have read David Chadwick's book, uh, his biography of Shinryu Suzuki, Crooked Cucumber, which I highly recommend. I thought it was really an excellent book. And in it, he points out that this actually was a very important moment in Suzuki's life. And it was fairly late in Suzuki's life. It probably occurred in 1968 or 1969. And Suzuki died about 71, early 71, maybe. So this is pretty late in his career. It was when he almost drowned at Tassajara. And uh, so I just want to share with you that story. And again, about being free from death, not escaping it, or not trying to deny it in some way. And the story is, so he's at Tassajara, and he wanted to cross this creek that was at Tassajara. And the way he tells it, he says, uh, there were many beautiful girls over there on the other side of the creek. So I tried to go over there. <laughs> and he says, forgetting that I couldn't swim. And I almost drowned. My guess is he didn't forget he couldn't swim, but it's just a creek. He was probably thinking it was no big deal. He just, you know, deal with that. And he also says here, he knew I would, I'll, I'll just read what he said. He goes, I knew I would not drown because there were many students and someone, someone would help me. So I was not so serious. But what, what uh, Chadwick reveals in the biography, that there's a whirlpool right there, right where Suzuki was going in and it pulled him down, it pulled him down. So anyone who's gotten caught in a whirlpool, you know, that holds you down, <laughs> you know? And you, if you're lucky, you get kicked back out again and finally you can, you know, but he got pulled down and he, you know, put his arms out and he couldn't alleviate the situation. He tried to reach for the legs of those beautiful girls and he couldn't reach their legs. So then he thought, well, I'll, I'll just get to the bottom and I'll just walk across the creek. But he couldn't get to the bottom to walk across. And then there he was, he swallowed some water. Nobody seemed to notice he was gone. In fact, the way Chadwick describes it, nobody really paid attention when Suzuki went in <laughs> and then he got pulled down. And it was a few minutes before somebody said, where's Roshi? <laughs> and it was a clear creek so they could see him. So then they, they pulled him out. But it's interesting because he doesn't talk about that part, the getting pulled out of the water. He just talks about, going under. This is what he says. He says, um, again, he says, I knew I would not drown <clears throat> because there were many students and someone would help me. So I was not so serious, but the feeling was pretty bad. I was swallowing water 
So I stretched out my arms, hoping someone would catch me, but no one helped me. I decided to go to the bottom to walk, but that was not possible either. I could not reach the bottom and I could not get to the surface. What I saw was the legs of beautiful girls, but I could not take hold of their legs and I was rather scared. At that time, I realized that we never have good practice until we become quite serious. Because I knew that I was not dying, I was not so serious. And because I was not so serious, I had a very difficult time. Now, this is where it gets interesting. He says, if I knew I was dying, I would not have struggled anymore. I would have stayed still. Because I thought I had another moment, I did not become serious. <clears throat> Since then, my practice has improved. Now I have confidence in my practice. So I've been telling you how I sit in Shikantaza. So to me, that, that is really what is powerful to me about that story is he found himself in this place where he couldn't go up, he couldn't go down, swallowing water. Nobody seemed to be paying attention to him. As he said, if I knew I was dying, I would not have struggled anymore. So struggling to, to make it. But because I thought I had another moment, I did not become serious. And he continues after that, he says, when you are not thinking that you have another moment, then naturally you can accept things as they are. You can see things as they are. You will have perfect wisdom at that time. So when you are not thinking that you have another moment, then naturally you can accept things as they are. You can see things as they are. So the point of his story isn't, <clears throat> I don't know, don't save yourself when you're drowning. You know, that's not the point of the story. Or the point of the story isn't, time to get serious, save your life. That's not the point of the story either. The point of the story is get serious. Don't think you have another moment. Realize that reality is right here, <clears throat> excuse me, in this moment. It's showing up now. This is it. No other moment, just this. When you are not thinking you have another moment, then naturally you can accept things as they are. Does that make sense? If you don't think you have some other place you can be, <laughs> some other way that it can be, which is the next moment, then you can truly accept things as they are right now as they're showing up. How do I do that, people ask? How do I accept things as they are, especially when they suck? <laughs> well, that's how you do it. You don't think about another moment. You don't think about it being better, the better place I can be where it doesn't suck. You see this icy landscape. You see the bounteousness for what it is. It's not so far so good, so much as it is just so, right? just so. You don't even need to make it good. You don't need to say we've gotten this far, just so. You can accept things as they are. You can see things as they are. Time to get serious is to be released from death in death. In this moment, this moment, as I said, in permanence is this moment. To be released from death is to release into impermanence to realize the impermanence that is self, the impermanence that you are. That's to get serious with that, not to try to do an end run around it or to hope that these teachings are providing us a way. Oh, I get it now. Everything's impermanent, so I'm not really going to die. <laughs> no, that's not right. Just pay attention. I'm not, re I'm not really going to die. I'm going to die. You know, these are the things that we do that get us in trouble. 
<laughs> these are the things we do that keep us from getting serious. Get serious and be with what is. Realize the impermanence of self. Realize the impermanence that you are. And since I've repeated that, I'm guessing that this is the end of my talk. <laughs> so uh, if anyone has questions or comments, I welcome them at this moment. Yeah, Ken, why don't you go ahead and unmute yourself? Hi, Steve. Um, thanks, uh, thanks very much. It's a very, very thought provoking talk. Um, in fact, it, it, it reminded me um, and brought to mind uh, a former colleague of mine, uh, a guy called Len. Uh, Len and I used to sometimes uh, teach uh, a module on morbid anatomy to, uh, to first year medical students. Len had a habit of, uh, of beginning the series of lectures by, by writing on the whiteboard, life is a terminal condition. Um, you would be amazed, or maybe not, at, at the furore in the lecture hall uh, and the look of amazement on some of these 19-year-olds uh, and their, their attempts to actually argue against the statement. And in fact, sometimes uh, things would become so animated that we'd actually set an essay um, life is a terminal condition, discuss. Um, fascinating, some of the answers. 19-year-olds who, who had never actually thought of their own mortality before and, and who would go to great lengths to actually um, deny it. Um, I, I just thought I'd, I'd share that. It just, just reminded me of, uh, of that. Highly amusing in some respects. Yeah, thanks for sharing. Right, and then the, the view that, that, that putting it that way uh, is being negative somehow. So the tendency I know with students I've had when I've posited teachings like that, I mean, I like the way you put that, that's very well stated, um, is for students to say, well, that's just the downer way of looking at it, you know? But uh, yeah, no, thanks for sharing. Uh, I remember the first time I read Waiting for Godot and there's something in there about giving birth astride a grave. <laughs> And that was like, wow. <laughs> yeah. So th thank you, Ken. I appreciate that.